it's called index. Uh, yeah, I, I clicked on recording. Ah, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <I didn't laughs> okay. <that>. Sorry <laughs> for that. <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, so this session is recorded. Uh, and uh, again, uh, welcome uh, on behalf of uh, KVS, the Royal Dutch Economic Association, Koninklijke Vereniging voor Staathuishoudkunde in Dutch, and Tilburg University, who organized this uh, session. And a uh, very special welcome to Camille Lande of uh, the London School of Economics, who is willing to uh, give a, a very interesting presentation about the policy question, should we ensure workers or jobs, uh, which of course is especially relevant uh, during the COVID crisis uh, we have just seen and which has not entirely ended yet, I believe. Uh, and we also have three um, very interesting discussions. Uh, I believe by Ronald Wolthoff, uh, who is associate professor at the University of Toronto, Yvonne Adema, who is program leader in uh, macroeconomics at the CPB Netherlands Bureau for Economic Policy Analysis, and Daniel Wagmeester, who is director of the Economic Policy uh, Department at the Ministry of Social Affairs. So the program for this afternoon is that uh, Camille will have uh, 30 minutes for a presentation, and then we'll have uh, 10 minutes for each uh, discussions to reflect on uh, Camille's presentation and then we'll have about 25 minutes left for a plenary discussion and I encourage uh, everybody to participate in the discussion and the final minutes will be for uh, the chairman of uh, the KTS Robert who is going to announce uh, some future meetings. So um, I propose we get started and uh, Camille, uh, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, uh, Daniel, for the for the introduction, and thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm very much looking forward to this uh, interesting discussion on this topic, on which I've been uh, working extensively, along with uh, Julia Giuponi and um, Alice Lapel. I'm going to share some slides, if you don't mind. Uh, just tell me if right. So the. the the question we're asking stems from a, a very simple motivation, which is that um, when you look at the labor market policy responses to uh, the COVID crisis, uh, they've been really diametrically opposed uh, on both sides of the ponds. This is just showing you the two main kind of tools that have been used, unemployment insurance and uh, short-term work schemes in both European countries and in the US. Um, as you can see, in the COVID crisis, you have a massive increase in the fraction of individuals who are on unemployment insurance in the US. This is the, the blue line here. Uh, to the contrary, in uh, European countries, unemployment insurance does not bulge during the COVID crisis. What has been really absorbing the, uh, the, the, the shock in European countries is the massive extension of these uh, short-term work schemes. Okay, what's interesting is that you know uh, these type of differences we had seen already in previous recession, but definitely not to the same extent. These differences in labor market policy responses have also translated into uh, very different um, patterns of the evolution of the non-employment rate in the US and in Europe. So if you look at the non-employment rate in the US, it's extremely cyclical. At each recession, it increases a lot, and it has done so as well during the COVID crisis. In Europe, much to the contrary, uh, the non-employment rate is much smoother over the business cycle. And again, we've seen that during the COVID crisis, it did not increase much uh, despite the, uh, the, the, the magnitude of the shock. So the question we're asking is, you know, uh, to what extent uh, we should use short-term work or unemployment insurance and whether it matters. So just to be clear about unemployment insurance, uh, I mean the broad type of unemployment insurance systems that we see in, in most countries, which means that, you know, when you are hit by a shock uh, and the employment relationship is severed, then uh, eligible workers claim unemployment benefits, okay? These type of uh, policies are policies where what we're trying to ensure are the workers and we're trying to ensure them against the cost of job loss. Uh, by short-term work schemes, I'm gonna refer to all the, sh the, the type of, of policies that uh, essentially 
insure um, workers as well when the firm is hit by a temporary shock. Okay. Uh, but here, the difference is that you don't need to sever the employment relationship. The way it works is that in most of these schemes, the firm is going to temporarily reduce its uh, number of hours and the workers are going to be uh, partially um, uh, subsidized for the hours that have not been worked. So the main difference between UI and short-term work is that uh, in short-term work schemes, the employment relationship is not uh, severed, it's preserved. And so you can see that as a way to ensure the job match rather than ensuring the workers themselves, okay? So in order to try to kind of provide guidance and, and, and a framework to think about the relative merits of these two types of programs, um, the way Julia and Alice and I have been, you know, approaching the question is to start from the standard framework that we use in public finance. So we have a very strong tradition in public finance of looking at the optimal generosity of social insurance program uh, that dates back to the work of Bailey and also Chetty uh, 2007. And the general approach here is very simple. It's this idea that when you are putting in place social insurance program like unemployment insurance or short-term work schemes, uh, you're essentially doing a very simple balancing act between on the one hand, the insurance value of doing that transfer and the fiscal externality of doing that transfer. The insurance value, it's just basically the value that society puts to transferring $1 to the UI recipients or to the short-term work recipients, while the fiscal externality stems from the fact that whenever you're gonna transfer that $1, because individuals are gonna change their uh, behaviors, by individuals, I mean both firms and workers, the uh, cost of transferring that $1 is gonna be larger than $1. Okay, because you're creating distortions. So that's the, the, the general basic framework. And I think it's, it's a good starting point. But of course, whenever we're talking about, you know, this type of social insurance programs, we also care about the fact that they interact with the very functioning of the labor market. And therefore this standard framework needs to be extended to also account for the fact that, you know, labor markets are ripe with friction. And because of that, there is absolutely no reason why the labor market should be at any point in time at an efficient level. So there are going to be some labor market inefficiencies that these social insurance programs are going to interact with. They can amplify or hamper these pre-existing distortions. Just to give you an idea, you can think about, you know, uh, uh, friction such as liquidity constraint that may make for separations to be inefficient during recessions. But you can also think about just the search frictions, meaning that there are, are going to be some potential search inefficiencies. Or you can also think about inefficient reallocation. So all these type of inefficiencies, we also need to incorporate into the framework. And this is uh, uh, what, what we do as well in this, in this paper, okay? So so now what I'm going to do is very simple. I'm going to look one by one at each of the elements of that trade-off, the insurance value, the fiscal externality, and the correction of labor market inefficiencies, and compare how UI and short-term work uh, 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 deal with, with any of these single elements, okay? So let's start with the insurance value of, uh, of an employment insurance and, and of short-term work. So the, the value of insurance is of course gonna depend on how much workers value insurance. Okay, so it's gonna depend on the extent of their, their risk aversion, but that's gonna also matter a lot uh, whether individuals have other means to lose consumption. Uh, the size of the shock is gonna matter as well. So in general, it means that different workers are gonna be having very different value of getting UI or short-term work in terms of, of insurance. And therefore, when you want to compare the insurance value of these two programs, you want to you know, clearly understand who is receiving these programs, what their consumption losing means are, what type of shocks uh, they are uh, subject to. There is now a growing literature trying to do this, but it's a relatively recent literature. On uh, the unemployment insurance front, uh, the literature shows that actually the value of uh, the insurance transfer provided by unemployment insurance is actually quite, quite strong. It's also strongly heterogeneous. When it comes to the short-term work schemes, we know much less, but there are two very important facts to keep in mind. First, that short-term work tends to ensure uh, insiders in the labor market. In general, the people who get short-term work are workers who are already 
on uh, long-term contracts who are older, who have a better means to smooth consumption. Okay. The second thing is that short-term work tends to ensure much smaller and shorter shocks than unemployment insurance on average. Just to give you an idea of this, this is the evolution of the total net earnings plus transfers uh, during the Great Recession in Germany around the time of either job loss for the people who got into unemployment uh, insurance or uh, the first time people receive short-term work uh, in the case of, of short-term work schemes. And what you see is clearly the individuals that go on short-term work experience a much lower, a much smaller shock in terms of their overall resources than people who become unemployed. But also the shock is much less persistent for uh, people on short-term work than people that receive unemployment uh, insurance. So what that essentially tells us is that clearly the type of shocks that unemployment insurance uh, uh, insures are much larger. And in that sense, the value of providing these transfers is probably larger, that is for sure. Okay, but one interesting thing to keep in mind is that, of course, you can only insure with short term work uh, shocks that are, by essence, temporary. Because if the shock ends up being persistent, at some point, you know, the firms can no longer keep the workers in. And this is typically what you've seen in a context such as uh, Italy during the Great Recession, when we know that the shock ended up being extremely persistent because of the double deep recession that Italy went through. And here, what you can see, it's exactly the, the same graph as before, but looking at Italy now, what you see is that the workers on short-term work, well, they experience a shorter, a smaller shock to start with, but eventually, because the shock ended up being persistent, they ended up also being laid off, and you know they uh, essentially did not that much better than people who ended up being unemployed. Okay, good. So that's it for the insurance value. Now let's move to the question of the fiscal externality. Fiscal externality they stem from the fact that people change their behavior when uh, you put in place these social insurance programs. Okay, and. On unemployment insurance, there is a very extensive literature trying to measure these type of fixed externalities that you know stem from all other. And the consensus is that these fix fiscal externalities are usually pretty large. Okay, meaning that you know to transfer one dollar, it costs between one point five to two point five dollars on average. Okay, so that's actually quite large. As far as you know, short term work is concerned, we have much more limited evidence. Um, but it seems that actually, uh, from what we uh, uh, can gather in terms of evidence from the Great Recession, uh, it's surprising, but it, it seems like the level of moral hazard was much more limited than in the case of, of UI. Why? Well, I think there are some obvious reasons why that might be the case. First, it's the fact that uh, there is strict conditionality in short-term work. So you need that the firm must go through very specific shocks. During the Great Recession as well, most uh, countries only opened up short-term work schemes to very large firms where there was quite a large level of controls that you could do on you know, the hours that were done and so on and so forth. Okay? So I think that points to the fact that in general, the fiscal externality of short-term work might be actually relatively smaller than the fiscal externality that are created by the change in, in behavior of workers uh, that creates this huge moral hazard cost of UI. But I think for uh, what concerns the current recession, we should be extremely careful because what we've seen is such a massive extension of short-term work schemes to many different firms, in particular very small firms, is extremely little um, enforcement in terms of uh, making sure that hours were effectively reduced. Hours is extremely difficult to measure from the point of view of, of the administration. So I think it's not impossible that during the current recession, the level of uh, more leisure that went uh, uh, that went on with, with short-term work schemes uh, was actually much larger than, uh, than what we've seen before. Okay, good. But now let me move on to maybe the most interesting uh, uh, parts of, 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 of this uh, question, which is what happens with uh, these labor market inefficiencies. So as I said, one of the main reasons we have short-term work schemes is that we want to preserve job matches. So the first question to ask is, well, the short-term work actually saves jobs, okay? The, simplest thing that you can do in that respect is just to do a very simple correlation of the residual short-term work take-up 
as a fraction of the working age population. Over time, in all these different countries, France, the US, uh, Sweden, uh, during the COVID crisis, and correlate that with the residual change in non-employment rate. Okay, and what you see is a very strong negative correlation. Okay, meaning that clearly the larger the usage of short-term work by countries during the COVID crisis, the lower the uh, um, the, the increase in, in the non-employment rate. So in that sense, it is. Uh, kind of facile, strong evidence of uh, the fact that, yes, there is a strong positive correlation between short-term work take-up and employment. But of course, this is just correlational. The thing is, it's nice because now we have a series of detailed studies that try to get at the causal relationship behind the correlation that I just showed you. And that seemed to confirm that clearly short-term work schemes are very effective at saving jobs. Okay, so that's great. But that being said, why should we save those jobs? That's the second fundamental question. Is this efficient to save these jobs? Are jobs saved by short-term work scheme? jobs that we actually want to save, or are there marginal jobs that actually should be uh, severed and, 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 and we should let reallocation in the labor market operate? So here, the question is, in, in the absence of short-term work, would the separation that we would have seen be inefficiently high? Okay, So to understand this, the first thing that we have to understand is why matches to start with those two matches are valuable. They are valuable because, well, it's costly to um, find a new job, uh, especially when you have specific human capital, but it's costly also for firms to recruit. Uh, there are very long run scaring effects of, of becoming an employee. So clearly, both from the point of view of firms and of workers, everybody has strong incentives to preserve job matches. So why is it that these job matches would be severed if we didn't have short-term work? Well, it's because there might be a lot of additional frictions that prevent those job matches to continue, okay? There are some potential frictions that prevent firms to hoard their labor optimally to preserve these job matches. What are these frictions? Well, first and foremost, liquidity constraints. You might want to keep your workers, but if you want to keep your workers, you need to pay them, even though they might be much less productive in a downturn, even though you, you know that in the future, they're going to be productive again. So if you don't have the liquidity, then you might have to sever those job matches. And here, I think this is clearly the, the type of frictions on which we have the, the largest evidence. Clearly, there is a sense in which liquidity constraints are a very important factor in explaining both the take-up and the employment effects of short-term work. Okay, But you can think of many other frictions, such as bargaining frictions. Okay, It might be possible for the firms to say, well, I would like to reduce your hours or I would like to reduce your wages, but it's impossible to re-bargain with your workers at any point in time. And in that sense, it might be difficult for workers and firms to get together and uh, essentially make sure that the, the, the job match is preserved if there are strong uh, frictions that prevent some rebargaining. Okay, uh, There are also additional frictions that are actually created by the very existence of unemployment insurance because the largest the generosity of uh, unemployment insurance, the largest the incentives for both firms and worker to um, to uh, several matches uh, in the face of a downturn. So all in all, I think there is now relatively strong evidence that yes, indeed in downturns, uh, separations can be inefficient EI and in that sense, saving those jobs through short-term work schemes might be efficient, okay? But of course, it also begs the question, why would short-term work be the only policy tool to address these inefficiencies that create these inefficient separation? For instance, we said, well, uh, there is some liquidity constraints, but couldn't we provide liquidity directly rather than use short-term work? So here, I think what the big advantage of, of short-term work is that it's very expedient, but it has also very strong positive selection properties compared to the general type of uh, liquidity provision program that we've seen during the COVID crisis. Why? Well, because a firm has to agree to reduce its hours. So basically, it wouldn't do so if it was doing absolutely well. Okay, So I think there are some strong kind of uh, selection properties of short-term work that make it relatively efficient to uh, uh, um, provide liquidity this way. 
The other important thing as well that I want to mention is that we heard a lot during the crisis that, you know, actually there wasn't that much difference between the US and uh, Europe because the unemployment insurance system in the US could be made extremely similar to a short-term mortgage scheme. Why? Well, because of what they call temporary layoff or recall unemployment insurance, by which a worker is going to essentially go back to the same employer after a temporary layoff. Okay. So I think it's partially true. Indeed, when you look at the US, a very large fraction of the individuals that were laid off at the very beginning of the COVID crisis ended up going back to the same employers after the end of uh, the first lockdown. But still, it's not exactly the same because you do not have the absolute insurance that you are gonna go back to the same employer. And for the, from the point of view of firms, the workers, they can also search and therefore go on and find another employer during uh, their temporary layoff, which essentially creates additional frictions for reemployment. Good. Now, the final thing that I want to do in the, well, let's say, uh, do I have 10 minutes? Yes? Okay. Is uh, to uh, say a little bit more on the way these two types of programs, short-term work and employment insurance, interact with allocation in the labor market. So what's really important is that UI and short-term work both put a big break on reallocation because they decrease aggregate social effort. From the point of view of unemployment insurance, it's very simple. Workers, they have a disincentive to search the largest the generosity of the unemployment insurance system. For short-term work, it's just that if I stay with my employer, I am not becoming unemployed. And because I'm not becoming unemployed, I'm not searching as much as I would have absent short-term work. So in both cases, there is a strong break on reallocation that you can see again using this very simple uh, cross-country correlation that I uh, showed you before. This is showing you the residual short-term work take up uh, on uh, the uh, x-axis here on that left panel against the residual change in what we call Q of theta, which is the job filling probability. So this is essentially telling me for any vacancy that a firm opens, how quickly that vacancy is going to be filled. And what you can see is that clearly the largest, the short-term work take up, the lowest, the uh, uh, probability that a firm is going to be able to fill a vacancy. So clearly, there is a direct mapping between the amount of uh, generosity of short-term work and the uh, ease with which firms are going to be able to uh, find workers. And you find the same negative relationship when you do the same exercise, but using UI now. Okay? So in both cases, we have programs that hamper uh, reallocation in the labor market. Okay, good. But now, is this a good or a bad thing? Well, it depends critically on whether we believe that in a recession, the labor market is too slack or is too tight. It turns out that, you know, in recessions, generally speaking, the labor market tends to be slack. Why? Well, because we have many workers who search for jobs and very few firms that post vacancies. Okay. So what that means is that we might end up during recession in situations of very low labor market tightness. And if tightness is too low, it can be actually socially inefficiently low, okay? The key idea is to think of a world where I'm in a recession, there are no jobs, okay? But there are a lot of workers. Workers end up in a rat race. The more they search, well, they climb the ladder, but there are only so many uh, jobs to be had. And therefore, the uh, uh, search, the, the increase in search effort that uh, workers uh, do is essentially akin to a rat race and is socially inefficient. Okay, so this is the logic by which pushing tightness up during recession by essentially decreasing the amount of uh, search that uh, workers do can be socially desirable. Okay, but is that true in the current recession? Well, I think it might very well be the case that this time is a little bit different. This is showing you the evolution of labor market tightness in the US over the past 20 years, okay? What you see is that uh, labor market tightness is usually very low during recessions, okay? What I showed you, the labor market is too slack, okay? We saw that during the dot-com bubble burst, but also during the Great Recession. And then it takes a very long time, usually, for labor market tightness to uh, get back to its kind of more efficient level. Here, I'm depicting the 
efficient level of uh, uh, labor market tightness uh, characterized by um, uh, uh, Michelin says in their uh, recent JPB paper, but what you see is that like, clearly in the past 20 years, we were usually in a world where the labor market was always kind of too slack. But then in the past five years, things kind of changed. Okay, And we ended up seeing a very long kind of uh, trend that ended up in a situation where the labor market entered the COVID recession in a very, very high level of tightness. And that is quite unique because we saw a little bit of a decrease in tightness during the recession, but very quickly again, we ended up at extremely high of labor market tightness. So clearly there is a sense in which, you know, even though in recessions, we like to decrease such efforts to keep tightness a little bit low, in the current recession, we might not need to do that much of this because we are in a time of structurally very high uh, labor market tightness. Okay. The final thing I want to mention as well, uh, as far as relocation is concerned, is the fact that compared to UI, short-term work has additional kind of interactions with relocation, and specifically when shocks end up being persistent. Why? Well, because imagine a very persistent and asymmetric shock making certain firms or certain sectors essentially need to disappear. Okay, then the problem with short time work is that keeping workers in firms that you know if the shock is persistent are going to have to go. Okay, so there are some job matches that are essentially persistently from now on uh, low value and that you would like to separate. And short time work by separating these precise matches might actually keep them alive too long and delay the positive or firm relocation. Looking at Italy with Giulia Giupponi, we uh, have shown in a recent paper that, yeah, uh, indeed, there is evidence of this type of mechanisms. In uh, Italy, we saw uh, uh, that persistently low productivity firms prior to recessions were much more likely to do short term work, uh, that these firms had very little positive long run effects of actually taking up short term work during the recession, and that also they imposed negative uh, employment growth effects on high productivity firms in the same local labor market. Basically, they prevented by keeping their workers in the more productive firms from growing, okay? That being said, I should add that the magnitude of these effects, even though significant, is relatively small, okay? So that, you know, made me think when we enter the COVID recession that, you know, we shouldn't worry too much about reallocation. But again, this time might be different. Why? Well, because of the nature of the short-term work uh, expansion that we've seen during the COVID crisis. It's so massive and the usage has been so prolonged compared to what we've seen during the Great Recession. Another thing that is kind of, you know, raising some eyebrows is when you look at the uh, delinquency rate of uh, small and medium uh, firms, it's actually extremely low today. It's at the historic low, even lower than previous uh, pre uh, prior to the Great Recession. So there is clearly a sense in which, well, maybe we might have kept a lot of firms afloat uh, through the use of these short-term work uh, schemes, uh, and, and, and there might be some reallocation needed at some point. But of course, all of this is going to depend critically on whether we believe that the shock is going to be very persistent for some sectors or not. And there is a substantial uncertainty on that front as well. And therefore, how to deal with this in the context of the recovery is a very uh, open policy question, I think. Good. So just to conclude, I think um, if you look at it, my kind of one cent on short-term work versus UI is that short-term work is extremely valuable in the face of very large temporary shocks. Unemployment insurance to the contrary is much better for persistent and asymmetric shock that requires some reallocation and by which you want workers to essentially change jobs, find a new job, and that requires some period of transition that must be short. okay? That being said, while the policy debate has been tending to oppose a lot short-term work and UI, it turns out that these two policies actually exhibit extremely strong complementarities, okay? And therefore, I believe that strong cyclical programs like short-term work can be extremely valuable complements uh, to UI to respond to recession, and especially in countries where we already have generous unemployment insurance and uh, relatively uh, strict uh, labor market protection programs. But that being said, uh, I think the current recession has uh, 
raised some absolutely unique questions. Uh, and because these policies put break on uh, reallocation in a context where uh, labor market tightness is already structurally high, uh, there are, of course, important questions on how to deal with you know, getting rid of the high generosity of these programs as we go through the recovery. I'm done. Thank you, Camille, for your very interesting presentation. And I think uh, uh, we can have a lot of discussion, but I, I will keep my mouth uh, shut for now and first give the floor to Ronald. Uh, yeah, I should be unmuted now. Very good. Um, let me start by thanking the organizers uh, for, for inviting me and, and giving me the opportunity to, to discuss this very interesting um, paper, which I really enjoyed reading. Um, I think Camille's presentation was very clear, but I just, oh, do you guys, you don't see the second slide, I think. Uh, no, we are, we just see the first, yeah, now if something- Okay, now it works. Okay, very good. Um, <laughs> I just started by sort of writing down what in my mind is sort of this, the simplest possible setting in, in which you can think about the, the key question here, right? So you have a firm, the firm has a number of workers, and now there is a shock. You know, whatever the nature of the shock might be, the, the, the firm wants to, to reduce um, the, 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 the size of the, you know, the, the, its demand for labor. And, and so what should we do? Right, but what should a policymaker do? Should should we just let the firm fire twenty workers? Should we maybe compensate those workers by by making UI more more generous, or or should we try to to spread out the impact of this shock uh, and and by reducing the, the hours for everyone and and then providing some some short term uh, short time uh, work compensation. Um, of course, those are not the only two possibilities. You can think of, you know, payroll subsidies, combinations of these various programs. Uh, but, but in a nutshell, I think that's that's the, the question. It's an important question. It's very topical, as Daniel already mentioned. And and the contribution of the paper is to really summarize insights from from a number of empirical studies, uh, recent empirical studies uh, that that shed some light on, on key aspects of this question. Um, so let me just jump to, to my comments. Um, I, I just, this table, which Camille didn't show, but it is actually in the paper, sort of summarizes the, 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 the insights from the, the literature on, on the various uh, parts uh, of, of the question. And, and so I, I just want to, you know, add a few comments to a few of the pluses and minuses in, in the table here. So let me start with the, the value of the transfer. Um, Camille, I think, argued quite convincingly that, you know, the, the value of insurance provided by unemployment benefits is, is substantially larger than, than that of short-time work transfers. But I was wondering, is that really what we care about, right? Like, I think that's the relevant question. And again, there seems to be a bit of a delay. And here we go. Uh, that, that is the relevant question. If, if, you know, we take the world as given and we want to spend one extra dollar on, on either UI or short-time work compensation. But of course, like these are large macro style programs and, and we can have policies that move people from unemployment to short time work. So don't the results indicate here that, you know, if, if unemployed workers value an extra dollar so much more than, than people on, on short time work, isn't it preferable to, to move these workers, right? So, so doesn't doesn't this imply, doesn't this actually speak in favor of the short-time work programs, right? Like moving people from unemployment to short-time work or replacing one unemployed worker by two workers with reduced hours. Um, isn't, isn't that beneficial? The second question I had here is like, there is a very strong focus in the discussion on 
worker's valuation of the transfer, right? But clearly these policies also affect firms' payoffs, output, and, and, and social welfare includes that. Um, so, so shouldn't we think more about like how the policies affect you know firms part of the surplus and, and I thought that was uh, that was missing a little bit um, there is actually I'll come back to that a little bit later there are some studies that have looked at this question and, and might be able to, to shed some light on that um, excess layoffs um, I thought there's a bit of a tension between the conclusion Right, which, which is the first quote here, evidence confirms that short-time work can be an efficient and expedient way to attenuate the social costs created by excess layoffs. And the description and, and the measurement problem pointed out in the second quote, right? So the, the paper admits that obviously, right? Like if, if it's, it's perhaps not surprising that short-time work programs prevent layoffs, but to know whether that's welfare increasing, we need to know what the, you know, the match values of those matches were. And, and that's very hard to measure. And, and you might imagine that, you know, that's positive for some jobs that you save, but it's negative for other jobs that are being saved. And so my question here is like, you know, does, is, is the conclusion justified? given these, these obvious measurement problems that, that exist, right? And, and as, as Camille pointed out, the expected persistence of the shock is crucial in this determination. Um, but I think there is an interesting information problem there too, right? Like, it's not obvious to me that the government is going to have better information about the expected persistence of the shock than, than firms. Right? And, and so sh should we expect governments to be able to, to design policy optimally? Um, tightness, um, there's a sentence in the paper that says the evidence suggests that increasing the generosity of short time work or in unemployment insurance in a recession can be an effective way of alleviating the search inefficiencies created by rat race externalities. There's actually a little bit of a debate in the literature about this point, and, and I'm not sure that debate has been settled yet, whether there is a consensus. Um, there is work that claims to find larger drops in vacancies. Um, I think there is a bit of a question in how do you define tightness here? Do the papers that are being cited often define tightness as the number of vacancies over some measure of search effort of the workers. For example, the, the number of applications that workers sent to these vacancies. But of course, there is a bit of an asymmetry there. There is a search effort element on, on the worker side, whereas the, the number of vacancies right, is, is just some absolute number, it doesn't actually account for the fact that, that firms may also increase or decrease uh, their, their search effort over the business cycle. And, and so it's not obvious that that search effort is fixed. And, and so maybe we should account for, for varying search effort on the firm side um, as well. I don't know how much time I still have. I'm running out of time probably. Yeah, one or two minutes. I'll skip the health externalities given that it wasn't discussed. Uh, I, the, the paper does a great job summarizing various empirical studies. There is actually quite a bit of work on this particular topic in, in the more quantitative macro uh, literature, you know, papers that, that calibrate equilibrium search models often. And, and they provide some insights as well. Actually, several of these speak to the specific points that I, I brought up earlier. And, and so I, I was wondering whether, you know, there wouldn't be value in, in, in discussing uh, some of the evidence in, in that. Um, so let me conclude. I think this is a, a very valuable summary of empirical evidence. Uh, but my main question um, to Camille, who I know has worked on both empirical and more theoretical work, is 
Like, don't we need more explicit theory to make the step from that empirical evidence to the conclusions, right? Like, and, and the interpretation. If we want to know whether, you know, short time work programs were the right thing to do at the beginning of COVID, can't we, can't we make that decision on, on the basis of the empirical evidence alone, or, or shouldn't we, you know, write down a model and, and use the empirical evidence to, to calibrate that? So let me stop here. Thank you, uh, Ronald. You made uh, a lot of important uh, comments, I think. So uh, uh, I'm sure we can discuss some of them uh, after uh, the next uh, discussions. So, uh, Yvonne, I think Camille already uh, addressed uh, the issue of productivity. I'm quite sure that you will have to say something about that as well. Yes, or yours. So you see my screen now, eh? Yes. Yeah, okay. I see something else, but... Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you very much. Um, also, uh, thank you for inviting me to discuss this paper. I think it was... Uh, it's a very interesting read. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's the, the comparison between uh, the US and, uh, and Europe provides some uh, insightful uh, insights. Um, what I want to do in my discussion is uh, show you some results of a study we did last year on the economic effects of the, um, the COVID support in the Netherlands. Uh, and what I will show is that even though in Europe we used uh, short-term uh, schemes, uh, the, the, well, how generous it was, it, it was quite different between countries. Uh, and then I will focus on the Netherlands and, and uh, mainly focus on the point indeed uh, Camille made on, on this last point in how this how did this affect uh, reallocation and uh, and the process of business dynamics. So we, we did some research on that. So that's what I wanted to do here. So let's see whether this works. Go, yeah. So you see my next slide? Yes. Yeah, good. Yeah, so uh, just to give you a, a quick glance of how generous the, so the, the study we did focused on uh, 2020. So that's important to realize. Uh, so really the beginning of the, of the COVID crisis. Uh, and in the beginning, uh, as other uh, countries, uh, the Netherlands implemented um, uh, job retention schemes or short-term uh, working schemes. Uh, but in the Netherlands, they were very generous. So in the Netherlands, the replacement rate uh, was 100%. And the government uh, paid 90% uh, of, of these uh, subsidies. So they were very generous compared to other countries and also compared to the unemployment benefit system we have in the Netherlands, where we, where, which is around 70% uh, of the wage. Uh, so it was very generous, but as Camille pointed out, and I think that, that holds for a lot of countries, it was very effective eh, in preserving jobs. And um, uh, it, it meant that the unemployment rate in the Netherlands really didn't rise a lot. So in 2020, the unemployment rate only uh, increased by 1.4 percentage points. And here also in this graph, we see very clearly that the US really stands out. Eh? So there the unemployment rate grows much more, which is, I think, very, you can explain this very well by the, the difference in schemes. Um, and it, so it was very effective in preserving jobs and, and make sure that the unemployment rate did not uh, uh, go up so much. And it was also very effective in uh, preserving firms. So the number of bankruptcies uh, was, uh, is, well, is, is, is historically very low. This is something also we see all over Europe, but especially also in the Netherlands. Um, and what we try to do uh, in our study is relate this to the support the firms got so and this is so you see some indication of, of what the support measures did so what we show in this right graph is um, eh, on the on the y-axis you see the number of exits for firms that got uh, support and uh, here uh, on the x-axis the exits uh, among firms without support and every dot is a different industry 
And what we see is that basically all the dots are below the 45 degree line, which means that, uh, well, the number of exits uh, among firms that did not receive support was much higher. And this makes sense, of course. Eh? Uh, but here you see, for example, in the indust industries that were hardest hit by the, by the COVID crisis, so, for example, uh, in uh, the, the sports and uh, recreation industry, hospitality, casinos, they are all here. There, the exit rates uh, among firms that did not receive support was uh, between 15 and 20 percent, while it was below 5 percent for firms that did not did, that did receive uh, support. So the support really helped uh, uh, for firms to survive, basically. So in that sense, it was very uh, effective. But as Camille said, it, it, the, the support was also very extreme. So it was very generous. And the COVID crisis, of course, uh, did last quite long. And, and what we did in our study, we, we had a look at uh, the relationship with, with productivity. And I think what our results show is also very similar results as Camille found for Italy after the Great Recession. Um, so what we see is actually, so what we did here, is panel regressions uh, where we include fixed effects to control for industry differences. So it's not, um, yeah, so the results uh, are not driven by uh, industry specific effects. Yeah? So for example, the fact that uh, uh, in the hospitality, uh, you have mainly uh, low productivity uh, firms. So we control for that. And what these two graphs show is for different percentiles of uh, productivity. So productivity in 2019 of firms. So before the crisis, is that uh, on the one hand, low productivity firms received support um, more often. So the probability that, so this is a fraction of firms that receive support. So you can interpret this as the probability that they receive support is much higher among low productivity firms. And also if they receive support, they got a much bigger amount. So uh, low productivity firms were more uh, likely to receive to receive uh, support and also the amount they got uh, was higher. Uh, and then we had a look at so so it, yeah the, the question of course is is this a bad thing? Well, we compared the exit rates of again for these different percentiles of uh, or, or, uh, for for different uh, uh, productivity firms, and what we show in this table is actually. The exit rates before the COVID crisis, so in the years 2019 and uh, 18, and there you see uh, that the number of exits uh, among the lowest uh, productivity decile is much higher. So let's uh, so before the COVID crisis, around 10% of the low productivity firms uh, would exit, and this declined to 2.2%. So the the decrease. Can I, was, uh, yeah. Can I ask a short question? So. How did you measure the, you say is labor productivities. So mm -hmm. how did you measure that? Because it's per firm and just the output per employee. Now it's value added. Per employee. Yeah. 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 And it's firm data indeed. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and then what, what you see is that uh, the COVID crisis actually for all deciles, it declined. Eh? So that's also what you saw in the, well, it, it, you see this in all the figures, basically, that uh, actually the number of exits for all firms was lower, but the decline was uh, much, much uh, higher among these low productivity firms. Well, if we combine this with the fact that we know that also low productivity firms received more support, that this is some indication that actually the support really, um, well, uh, um, yeah, distorted maybe the process of, of reallocation um, and, and the cleansing effects of recession, that, let's say. So the, the process of uh, creative destruction. Uh, it's, it's not uh, a causal um, uh, evidence, but it, it is a, it's just a strong indication, I would say. Uh, and then the question also arises, so this is the, in the first year of the crisis, but we know, yeah, so the crisis also lasted in uh, 2021, uh, and then we still had these measures in place. They were a little bit less generous, but still we had them in place. And uh, as Camille explained, it really makes sense to have these type of support packages in, uh, in a recession where there is a, a lot of slack in the, in the labor market. But also in the Netherlands, there is an indication that this is a really different recession, that actually the labor market 
became very tight. And that's what I show you in a relatively simple way uh, with the beverage curve for the, for the Netherlands. So you see here that during the, the COVID crisis, the, the labor market actually became tighter and tighter, which means that actually support, eh, so support went to low productivity firms. Normally these firms would fail or at least part of them would fail. Uh, and now they are kept in place. People uh, still work there uh, at these low productivity firms. And this, well, it becomes more problematic, problematic over time when the labor market becomes more tight. So there is no slack basically in the Dutch labor market. Um, so this, this is a little bit more on what happens in the Netherlands, what happened in the Netherlands. So what can we conclude? Well, what we concluded in the study last year is that actually indeed the support packages were extremely effective in preventing large increases in the unemployment rate. So it really preserved jobs um, and also it preserved uh, firms. Uh, also had it, it provided firms with liquidity. Uh, but at the same time, we have some indications that it really distorted the process of firm dynamics. Uh, and there has, have been some other studies already for other countries and there uh, they don't find, uh, at least they find less evidence for this than what we find for the Netherlands. So it seems that this is a little bit more the case in the Netherlands than in other countries. Uh, and what we conclude is that actually yeah, in the beginning of the crisis, this is maybe not a bad thing because the main uh, goal was also to preserve these jobs and preserve these job matches. But the longer the crisis lasts, the higher these costs will be. So that was what I wanted to say. So thank you very much. I will stop sharing. Thank you, yeah. uh, Yvonne, for your clear presentation. And now we go to the final discussion by Daniel Wagnes. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, uh, Daniel. And thanks for, um, for the interesting paper. Um, the the thought-provoking idea of complementarity rather than them being um, uh, substitutes. So I think that's that's a very interesting insight that we will also take along board on board for um, our current discussions on design designing a, a long term um, short time work program. Uh, so my colleagues were stoked to receive the paper. So thank you in advance. Um, I also share the the main conclusion that um, short term work programs can can serve a good purpose in in sort of freeze style uh, recessions, uh, short um, but big shock. Um, and um, I think the question is, uh, can we identify those properly? Uh, as Ronald said, um, um, do, can we expect governments to um, design policies optimally? Um, and as I was involved the last two years in trying to design these policies, I'll try and uh, say a few words on that. Um, I don't have any slides. I will just uh, talk at you. Um, I will briefly um, talk a little bit about the, the Dutch uh, short time work um, scheme, the NOV, the NOW. Um, what did it look like? Uh, then I will uh, try and uh, give you a brief insight in sort of the, the more the political economy, economy behind the decisions we made the last two years. Um, and then share some, some final thoughts with you, hopefully within 10 minutes. Um, so we... Uh, when faced with Corona, um, we we uh, we basically came to sort of a set of five different instruments about uh, uh, two years ago. Um, the first was a, a basically a pause for companies uh, on all their tax payments, um, so they could postpone until um, after the crisis, which turned out to be later and later. But by October this year, they will start paying again. Uh, those were huge amounts, uh, billions of, uh, of euros. There is a, a compensation for a fixed cost of, uh, of companies. Um, and the complement to that is the short-term work, the, the now, which is the compensation for wage costs. So these things uh, went hand in hand for most companies. Um, and then for self-employed workers, we have a basically a, a basic income support, which is administered by the municipalities. Uh, so that's not based on their previous um, um, uh, revenues, but that's based on, on the social minimum. Uh, so this is different than the, the now scheme, uh, but there is some support for self-employed. And then there's obviously sort of credit lines and guarantees and also some sectoral support. Now, of these different measures, um, apart from the, the postponement of the tax bill, the, the now was by far the biggest scheme. Uh, and to give you a bit of an idea, the first quarter we had the now, so that this is March 2020 uh, and the, the consecutive two months after that, there was 140,000 companies who applied for it. 
Um, and these companies in total employed 2.7 million employees. Um, so this is, uh, this is huge for the Netherlands. And the total bill was 10 billion euros for this quarter alone. Um, so this maybe is to be expected in the initial phase of the crisis, but a year later, uh, so the first quarter of 2021, uh, still 75,000 companies applied for um, now uh, involving 1.3 million employees and about 4 billion euros. Um, and then again, sort of by the end of that year, uh, so the last, last quarter of 2021, we still had uh, uh, 40,000 companies applying for now and 700,000 employees. Uh, so the scheme was big um, and also even though it diminished over time uh, during the crisis, it, it also stayed uh, fairly big. Now, this doesn't mean that uh, all the employees in these companies were, were sitting on the bench, if you will. Uh, so uh, not 100% of the payroll was covered, uh, but it gives you an idea of the, of the size of the impact on the labor market. Um, I think also it's important to note a little bit the design of the, uh, the now is a little bit different, I think, than the uh, uh, short-term work schemes described in the paper. Um, there is no contribution uh, into it, so it's not premium funded. Uh, it's basically um, um, paid out of, out of uh, taxpayers' dollars. And also it's not based on uh, the reduction of the hours worked. So there's no bookkeeping of, of the hours reduced. Um, but it's based on the total payroll of the company involved. Um, so there's also no registration of which workers are under the NOW scheme. There's only a registration of which companies are in the NOW scheme. Um, and then the compensation is basically scaled to the loss in turnover of the, the year compared to 2019. So, uh, so um, comparable to the graphs that Yvonne was showing. Uh, and the threshold there is a 20% um, decrease in turnover. Um, and this is initially estimated by the entrepreneur and then later calculated to, um, to sort of, um, yeah, to, to do the administration uh, with hindsight. So this way we could very quickly um, uh, transfer money and provide liquidity and then later check whether eligibility was, um, was proper. So why, why did we choose for such a scheme? Um, and I would say this, um, this was not an academic uh, discussion. We had a couple of weeks or a couple of days, I would even say, uh, to come up with something like the now. Um, so um, it's, it's interesting to discuss it academically, but we were in a different mindset when, when all this happened in March 2020. Um, in the Netherlands, there was a short-term work scheme the Werktijd for Korting, which is built for sort of um, um, calamities beyond the control of an entrepreneur. Um, the numbers that are very low per year and the scheme is administered by hand. So our first problem was we have this scheme and we saw sort of the, uh, the, the, the applicants rise by day into the thousands, which we couldn't administer. Um, so that's the first thing we had to do. We had to, we had to stop this scheme that we already had. Um, then there was the idea of the Deeltijd VW, so a proper short-term work scheme, which had been floating around for a while, but we hadn't really um, finished the thinking about that. Uh, so the idea was there, but it wasn't uh, operational. Um, so we, the first thing we did, obviously, was look at the current uh, unemployment insurance um, and asked ourselves the question, can we not just rely on that? Um, I think the first uh, signs from the UAV, our public employment service, were uh, probably not because the numbers we're expecting are so high that even the, the VV scheme, the unemployment insurance, will probably not be able to handle these numbers. Um, and also, obviously, to be eligible for unemployment benefit, you'd need to get fired first. And the assessment was this is sort of a short term crisis. Um, a freeze of the economy, if, if you will. So the logic was we're going to try and bridge the gap, um, enhance labor, ho labor hoarding, and then we can pick up where we, where we left uh, after the crisis. Um, and the idea was we cannot rely on companies to do this labor hoarding alone, mainly for the liquidity argument um, that Camille also mentioned. Um, so that led us to a search, what, what can we do instead? Um, uh, we looked at sort of generic tax relief, obviously not suited for this kind of crisis for um, basically providing liquidity for companies, but we also wanted to make a link with retaining employment. Uh, so in the end, we got to something like the, uh, the now, 
Um, also with the idea that fixing it on payroll, you could not just look at people on uh, um, uh, open-ended contracts, but also include people on short-term contracts. Uh, so the idea was uh, we, we basically take over the payroll of companies and then they can retain as many people as possible, regardless of what type of contract they are on. Uh, so this is also slightly better coverage than a normal unemployment uh, uh, scheme would have, since most people on short-term contracts also have very short-term um, accrual in their un uh, unemployment benefits. Um, and the only way why we could do this, because we built this scheme the now outside of the regular uh, systems of our public employment service. So this, this obviously in an academic setting is not a very persuasive argument, but for us, this was a very important argument to, to work within the unemployment insurance. Uh, we just couldn't do it. So we couldn't, for instance, say, let's extend the minimal uninsurance employment from three to six months. Uh, but because we couldn't administer that um, in, in the time uh, we had. Um, so that's sort of how the scheme came about. Then um, maybe a little bit the political economy side of things. Uh, I'd like to distinguish three, three sort of phases. The first was the startup phase, which I just described uh, of, of huge uncertainty. Uh, and politically, there was not much convergence about the, the thoughts behind uh, what we should do. So there was huge support. There was also a whatever it takes uh, uh, spoken by the Treasury. Um, so without a budget constraint, basically, we, we could make this, uh, this now scheme. And with the idea, we're bridging the gap. So this is a temporary solution. Um, so this resulted in an unprecedented speed of policy making and also quite novel for civil servants, uh, uh, the gratitude from a lot of companies and, uh, and workers. Um, then the second phase was obviously the phase where the, um, the gap that we were trying to bridge got longer and longer um, and, and the uncertainty still was, was huge. Uh, politically, this led to sort of a different dynamic in which everyone was sort of taking into account the, the, the now scheme, but was starting to add all kinds of uh, additional demands from, from lobby, from different sectors, from specific groups who weren't properly covered. Um, so the one size fits all uh, became less of an accepted solution. And there was a lot of pressure for tailor-made solutions that we couldn't really um, fit in practically. Uh, but the fact that we didn't have a budget constraint made it very hard to say, sorry, we cannot do this. Um, so the mindset was, can we improve this instrument? But it wasn't, can we already get rid of this instrument? Because politically, there was no space for that whatsoever. And also, um, there is a path dependency. We had built this instrument. There was another quarter of, of dire economic circumstances. So we had to sort of carry on with it, even though maybe we are starting to think this might not be the right response. Daniel, uh, I would like to keep some room for discussion. So uh, would you be able to finish uh, within two minutes? Uh, yeah, sorry, I was totally not paying attention to the time. Thanks for uh, that intervention. Um, yeah, then maybe a short word on where we are now, the phasing out. Uh, hopefully tomorrow we will send a letter to Parliament saying um, by the second quarter, we will no longer have the, the now scheme. Um, but we were only able to do this once the, um, the, the corona measures had, had fully stopped. So, um, a very important argument that sort of um, entered the public debate was a fairness argument. If companies are closed uh, or partially closed by government measures, then there needs to be direct compensation. So the idea that unemployment insurance is not, is not suited for this situation has very strongly taken hold and also makes it very hard to get, to get rid of uh, um, a short-term work type program like now. Um, given where, what we've been through. So um, maybe to conclude, some, some final thoughts. I think in the paper, um, looking at the Dutch context, uh, and I think Yvonne touched on that, an interesting uh, thing you could maybe look at is the, uh, the eligibility for a scheme. So if you have an employment insurance, at least you're targeting people who've, who've become unemployed. The problem with it now is that the, the companies and hence the workers we're targeting are not necessarily the workers who are affected by Corona or by COVID. So we're, uh, uh, the longer the scheme runs, the, the larger the, uh, the number of non-productive firms in the, in the graphs of Yvonne who we're supporting, who you do not want to be uh, supporting. Um, and I think this gets worse over time. Um, and um, I think maybe this is my main message in terms of, is this a good instrument? It is a good instrument. 
if we know we can do it for a short period, um, but once you have it, it's very hard to stop, um, even though you know uh, that the downsides are actually overtaking the upsides. Um, so I would say in theory, it's a very good addition to our tool set. In practice, um, I would hesitate next time to uh, offer it again to my minister because I know uh, nothing is as permanent as a temporary solution. Um, so maybe I'll leave it at that. Thank you. And sorry for running over. No, no problem, no problem. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. I think we have uh, a lot of um, points to further elaborate on, but it's, uh, I think uh, we should pick some, uh, some of those. And um, let me first give the opportunity to Camille to, uh, to respond to a few of the comments, not all. There's no time for that, but maybe you can pick two comments to reflect on. Okay, uh, but first, let me uh, thank all of you for uh, these great comments. I think uh, they are um, absolutely well taken. Um, maybe let's uh, let's start with uh, the more pragmatic ones, which is yeah, what? How do we create these schemes? Um, what what's working? What's not working? I think. What was great from uh, Daniel's intervention is uh, this clear understanding that actually details matter. Um, and uh, I think what, what, what's been really interesting during the, uh, the pandemic is that um, although everybody says, oh, we have a short-term work scheme, um, these are not the same schemes across countries at all. If you take the Dutch one or the British one compared to the French one or the German ones, they are very, very different. And I think, as you mentioned, uh, one of the key difference is to what extent do you make these schemes conditional on typically uh, hours reduction because you have a way to uh, measure hours, um, whether you make them individual specific rather than you know, a broad kind of provision of liquidity at the firm level. Uh, all these things we know from past uh, recessions or you know, uh, a little bit of the literature as well, that you know, these little details, they make a massive difference in terms of how much more hazard and therefore the overall fiscal externality and the fiscal cost of these programs, okay? I think what I would say on this front is that, well, expediency, of course, uh, dictated that, you know, we had to act fast. But if I were to give some kind of recommendation to the Dutch government, is that there is a way to create a, a tool that is only actionable in recession that is a little bit better at targeting. And for that, basically, you need to use the knowledge that's been accumulated in Germany, in Italy, in France, who have been using these, uh, in Belgium as well, that have been using these, uh, these, these uh, schemes for, for quite some time. And I think clearly you want a lot more conditionality. You want to leverage what I was trying to explain, which is the fact that the moment you make the program condition on reducing hours, you have extremely good selection properties, which is that only the firms that are actually willing to reduce hours are going to take that schemes. And they are typically the ones that are experiencing the shocks. Okay. Um, so it's, you know, all these little things uh, that actually end up mattering a lot uh, because clearly, you know, um, when you compare, for instance, the British scheme to the French scheme, in the British schemes, people could only be put to zero hours in order to benefit from, uh, from what was, so the short-term work scheme in, 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 uh, in the UK is called furlough or furlough scheme, okay? So this clearly is totally inefficient because, you know, of course, in some occupation during the corona crisis, a lot of people could work a little bit, could, you know, telework or whatever. So having schemes that make um, the access to the scheme condition on working zero hours are not good schemes. So you see, there are many small ways in which uh, for future recessions, the uh, programs that have been put in place could be improved uh, and, and, and therefore be actionable uh, and, and come at a much smaller overall fiscal cost, I think. Um, what else did I want to say? Well, there are, there are extremely uh, many good points, um, but uh, I think one very important point that has been raised is uh, to what extent we have a good way of knowing whether saving 
the jobs uh, that are saved with short-term work is a good thing or not, okay? And um, you said, uh, Ronald, oh, I, you know, I would love to know much more about this, and but I don't think there is actually a clear way to do that. Why? Well, because by definition, what we're trying to measure at that point is the expected continuation value of a match. That's extremely uncertain, especially, you know, in the face of crisis like the corona crisis. I mean, when the crisis hit, we didn't know at all whether that would be extremely long or extremely short term. And so I think, you know, knowing to what extent uh, uh, the jobs that we're trying to save are, you know, uh, jobs that should be saved or not is always going to be a tricky matter because we all always need to do that ex ante rather than ex post. Of course, ex post, it's easy to say, like we do in Italy, ah, look, we shouldn't have saved these jobs. But what's really interesting is when you look at the Great Recession in Italy, when it hits, everybody believes that it's going to be temporary, okay? Uh, and nobody expected that, you know, you would have the European debt crisis and then it's going to translate into a, a double deep recession. So I think we should be, um, yeah, extremely uh, uh, cautious in trying to, you know, make broad judgments about our ability to set to what extent uh, the, the, the jobs that we're saving are worth saving or not. I think we have to make judgment calls and this is where, you know, having a, a, a relatively good political debate around these things is, is extremely important as well. Um, so I leave it at that for these kind of first uh, reactions, but again, very happy to also comment on, on many other uh, of the other points that have been raised that are all excellent. Thank you, Camille. Uh, are there any other further questions from the floor? So I, have, I was oh, okay. wondering about um, about one thing. If this, if this, um, um, so in this uh, discussion about UI versus SDW, or maybe maybe both. Um, you also mentioned slightly the, the role of uh, employment protection legislation or kind of layoff taxes or kind of things like this. So how, how would that, how, how should kind of, how, how does the existence of having either very generous EPL as, as in the Netherlands or not so much in the US, how, how would that affect the, the policy mix or the trade-offs there? Okay, yeah, that's a good one. That's a, a difficult one as well. Um, so clearly, when you have extremely uh, strong uh, employment protection legislation, what that creates is essentially a huge cost to separation. Another way of saying this is that, well, it increases the uh, continuation value of the job much because separation becomes uh, extremely costly. Okay. And Therefore, in that respect, uh, that essentially means that the value of preserving uh, matches is higher. And uh, in that context, you would, of course, want to preserve more matches. But that's, of course, conditional on having this strong uh, uh, EPL uh, and not asking the important question of whether actually the overall policy mix uh, is, is optimal or not. So all the things I, I, I were mentioning were conditional on the existence of, the, of, of this EPL uh, to what extent the short-term work versus UI uh, mix would be affected. But I agree with you. The fundamental question is if we have these three kind of instruments, how would we best want to, to use them? And it's, it's very unclear because I mean, honestly, if you look at the overall economic literature, there is relatively little that would say that you want this strong employment protection legislation if you can provide a lot of these insurance through other means, such as unemployment insurance and short-term work. So that begs the overall question, which is, okay, but why do we still have this extremely strong employment protection legislation in a bunch of, of continental European countries? I think, well, it's partly because, well, at the end of the day, we uh, try to go in the direction of making the labor market a bit more flexible, but we couldn't go all the way. And we ended up with dual labor, mar dual labor, mar dual labor markets because we have, of course, um, uh, insiders that are, you know, able to protect some some some, some rights uh, more actively than than others. Um, but generally speaking, I mean, I continue to believe that uh, employment protection legislation is not necessarily such a bad thing in many contexts. Again, because what does employment protection legislation do that short-term work schemes or UI does? Well, employment protection legislation is a relatively flexible way 
to make firms choose basically the type of contracts that they want to offer, long-term contracts versus short-term contracts, based on their private knowledge of the uh, the length of the productive match that they are having. So there is a lot of private information in these type of choices of whether to choose a long-term contract or short-term contract that is totally internalized by firms. And therefore it's not, you know, clear to me that it creates huge, you know, uh, additional inefficiencies in the allocation of different workers to different types of contracts. Yeah. Okay, th uh, thank you. Before uh, uh, going to Nate, who has a question or remark, uh, is there any of the discussions who would like to uh, react to the points which we just raised, Ifono or Ronald or Daniel? Not for the moment. Okay, Nate, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the one thing that, that I'm missing a little bit is, is what difference does uh, COVID with all its health measures make in the design of these uh, short-term work packages? Um, on one hand, you can think that, that, that we have a world with short-term work and uh, unemployment insurance. And it doesn't really matter if we're in a pandemic or not. But I like Daniel's uh, argument um, about the, the fairness consideration of, of uh, uh, in the political economy argument that the government told many firms to just close down or to, to just shut, shut shop and that they should pay for that, that type of, uh, uh, that type of thing. So I'm, I'm, it can be, uh, to what extent does it matter and to what extent does it not matter? Um, I think the, the, the impact of the, the, the health policy measures was, of course, very asymmetric. Uh, and, and I think this is also relevant for the design of, of STW or, or uh, any, any COVID labor market policies. Yeah, so uh, clearly there are two dimensions to, uh, to your comment. One uh, that has to do with the, uh, the, the, the specific nature of the COVID crisis, which is that, yeah, you had some strong L690s as well. Uh, you wanted to close these firms because you wanted to uh, minimize the level of uh, social interactions. Uh, in that sense, yeah, clearly uh, anything that you could do, such as, yeah, a short time work scheme or whatever to keep workers at home, uh, add some additional social benefits through these L690s. But I think the other interesting point that you mentioned is this idea that, oh, there are fairness concerns uh, here. So you mentioned in terms of fairness, one important point, which is, uh, yeah, it's something that is uh, essentially uh, orthogonal to the firms or to the workers' behaviors. But that I think is the general kind of uh, way in which we see insurance, which is, yeah, we want people to get insurance against shocks that, you know, are outside their, uh, uh, their, their own actions. And of course, it's difficult to do because, well, when you do that, you can only do things that provide insurance but are conditional on, you know, actual behaviors. And that's always difficult. So you create more hazard because there is never a way to identify the pure kind of ortho orthogonal shock to their behavior. But I think when it comes to, you know, uh, social insurance, the Corona crisis is probably the best example of a shock that is so orthogonal uh, that clearly it made sense to provide quite a lot of insurance because we believe that, yeah, there, there would be relatively little more hazard. It's not like firms were actively trying to game the system. Um, everybody wanted to close shop uh, and make sure that, you know, the, the health situation would be, um, would, would be kept in, in check. Uh, another interesting avenue of research in terms of fairness when it comes to short-term work scheme that you did not mention, but I think is actually important from stupid kind of uh, focus groups that we uh, ran in Italy, because we wanted to understand better why, you know, Italy was so attached to its uh, Casa Integrazione, which is its, uh, its short-term work scheme. Fairness comes up quite a lot. So there is this idea that whenever uh, the firm is hit by a shock, the fact of being able to allocate the cost of the shock equally across workers by everybody reducing their hours rather than single picking a few workers that you would separate from actually has a lot of traction in you know uh, the way people describe why they care about uh, about short term work so that's another potential element and you know when it comes to our labor market institutions uh, these things that we tend to forget us as economists can have actually a lot of explanatory power uh, and yeah i think that's another interesting dimension of, of research uh, 
No, I I just had a question. Is that is that fairness or is that just standard risk aversion? Right, like any curvature on on the utility function, I think would give you the same result that that you know people prefer a small cut for for with certainty over you know a big cut with with a small probability. Um, so, so I'm not sure how to tell those apart. No, that's a fair point. Uh, yeah, uh, clearly. Uh, I was I was also wondering about the link with Yvonne's analysis that uh, the, the the health uh, the, the lockdown measures type of measures typically affected the uh, firms with low productivity, right? No, it's not true. Well, no, that of course that's true, but oh, okay. at least our results try to control for that. So within the sectors that were hit then still the, the low productivity, so with even within the restaurant, uh, for example, then it, um, so given that, it was mainly the low productivity, or at ah. least the low productivity also got these. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I can, I, I can also add, so I think fairness indeed is, can explain a lot, eh? also why we still have it and why we continue with these measures uh, uh, as soon as we have another lockdown. Uh, but the question is, why does it have to be so generous, I think? So why why is indeed the uh, current unemployment insurance mm. we have, why is that not enough? Uh, especially when it, yeah, the costs have become very large for the government. Okay, there's room for a final comment or remark. Oh, Simon has his hands raised already. Yeah, so, so I was just wondering, so because of the, the, the COVID policies, we closed certain sectors. So basically people also have, don't have to spend money on going to the hairdresser because it wasn't even possible to go to the hairdresser. So my question would be like, wouldn't it be optimal in those cases to actually increase taxes um, and therewith and so finance the unemployment insurance from, the, from an increase in taxes? Because I mean, people need, less money to, to, to keep up their, their uh, expenses, because now we just put everything to the next generation, basically. So, so I was wondering if Camille had, uh, did any research or like if he has any thoughts over, on that. Oh, that's, a, that's a good one. That's a tough one. But, uh, so it turns out that, yeah, during the COVID crisis in France, I was quite involved with um, advising the, the French government and we managed to get access to great uh, bank data uh, that allowed us to uh, look a little bit at consumption patterns, earnings pattern uh, throughout the crisis. And what's very clear is that, yeah, there has been, uh, but I think it's now well understood, uh, but there has been uh, essentially a massive protection of paychecks, uh, but because consumption was deeply constrained, basically that essentially ended up into higher savings. So it's just, you know, a, a very simple kind of uh, accounting uh, thing. But yeah, we paid income to ourselves, despite the fact that we couldn't consume. That meant that, you know, we created debt, public debt on the one hand, that ended up in uh, private savings. And, you know, when it comes to the whole debate about, ah, uh, then how should we repay this debt? Well, given we did that kind of accounting stuff once, we could do it a uh, second time in the other direction, quite simply. So yes, I've been advocating quite strongly for yeah having some form of, at least at the very top end of the uh, income and wealth distribution, some uh, higher uh, taxation of, of, uh, of, of wealth, given clearly there has been uh, this kind of uh, simple uh, accounting mechanism taking place. Um, yeah, I leave it at that because then, yeah, it's a... Uh, might end up being a very, very long conversation. Thank you very much, uh, all of you, uh, Camille, Yvonne, Ronald, and uh, Daniel. And before closing the session, I would like to uh, give the floor to Robert, Robert Dürer. Yeah, thanks a lot. Also from my side, uh, thanks so much, uh, Camille Lander, for a very insightful lecture. And uh, also to the three uh, discussants, Daniel Waagmeester, Ronald Wolthoff and Yvonne Adema. Uh, those were very interesting uh, discussions. So uh, yeah, our next um, event is already in uh, slightly more than a week. So next week on Friday, we have the annual 
National uh, Economics Olympiad. So a full day of uh, ambitious students uh, writing assignments uh, that were prepared by uh, various professors from throughout the country to compete for um, the honor of, uh, you know, being the winner of the Olympiad. And there's also some prize money to distribute. So that's next week, Friday. So registration is closed. We have a record number of almost 100 students that will compete next week. But uh, you can still register for the keynote lecture that is part of this event. So that's next week, Friday uh, at half past three. So the keynote lecture is uh, Kurt Brecke from NHH. Uh, he will talk about uh, economics of COVID. In particular, he will talk about uh, uh, pharmaceutical markets and innovation. Um, and so I think that will be extremely uh, interesting. So you can either attend in person at uh, Erasmus University Rotterdam here on campus. And then you can also take part in the drinks that will follow immediately after the lecture. Uh, but you can also follow the lecture of Kurt Brecke via live stream. And in both cases, you can register by sending an email to uh, the, the Secretariat of the Royal Dutch Economic Association. So with that, um, thanks once more. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week then. Thank you all for your attention and participation. Thanks again. Thank you.